Back in 2017, when Nintendo released Breath of the Wild, fans of the series were pleasantly surprised to find that for the first time in a 3D Zelda, we had finally been given a dedicated jump button. We also got the Paraglider, which is a wonderful tool that allows the player to translate height into horizontal distance. And of course, as you know, we went on to use these tools to break the game in many ways. After spending years jumping and gliding whenever we want, we've gotten pretty accustomed to it. But I was wondering to myself, what would the game look like if you took away these two ways of moving around? If we make Link wear some proverbial iron boots, just how far could we go with them? As it so happens, Nintendo mapped both of these functions to the same button, X, and so if you wish to run a challenge like this, it's pretty easy to do so. All you need to do is ban the X button. Now, I have seen a challenge like this done before where someone cleared the four divine beasts before Ganon, but I wanted to take that a little bit further. So, I'll be clearing the divine beasts, as he did, but I'll also be doing all 120 shrines and climbing the game's 15 towers. As you guys will hopefully soon see, the nature of this run requires us to pull some really interesting glitches and techniques out of our Breath of the Wild toolkit. And I think that it will be quite entertaining to watch. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to present the Breath of the Wild All Shrines X Button Challenge. Of course, as always, we begin our playthrough on the Great Plateau. Now this region of the game is designed for a new player who doesn't have a glider yet, so it'll be pretty easy for us. That being said, before we get too deep into the run, I'd like to make note of which actions we can and cannot perform. Of course, we're not allowed to jump, and we're also not allowed to use the X button to pull the glider out. We also can't jump while climbing, and this makes fighting the rain impossible. We also can't use a jump to do a shield surf, we're going to have to find other ways to get off the ground if we want to use that technique. While swimming, we can't use X to do a swim dash, but we could use Y to do a Zora spin if we have the helmet. We can't in combat do a flurry rush because that requires a jump as well. And in addition to that, we can't use Rivali's Gale because we can never hold down X if we can never press X in the first place. Our menuing is also affected a little bit. We can't use X to hold an item quickly, but we can use the menuing to do it, and if you want to put it away, the best way is to pull out Link's weapon, since we can't press X in the menu to put it away. Finally, our map usage is affected a bit. In areas like Hyrule Castle or a Divine Beast, we can't press X to leave easily, and we can't access the Hero's Path mode since that requires the X button. And as a final note, we can't press X to skip any cutscenes, we will have to watch them in their entirety. Now that sounds like an awful lot of things that we can't do, but if you run the game like this you'll find that 90% of it is perfectly doable without any real stress at all. And as for the remaining 10%, well that's what makes this video interesting to watch. A good example of the run being mostly easy is the Great Plateau. Everything in here was designed for a new player who doesn't know the controls and doesn't have the glider yet. There is nothing to be found on the Great Plateau that requires any advanced trickery or out-of-the-box thinking. Just run it normally without using the jump button. Complete the four shrines, no issues there really, and go and talk to the old man. He will reward us with the paraglider, which would be great, but of course we can't use it. Get a nice long look at it, we won't be seeing it for a while. With that out of the way, we make our way back to the Great Plateau Tower. And it is here that I'm going to show you guys the first way that we break the game despite our limitations. This is the jumpless version of the BLSS glitch. BLSS stands for Bow Lift Smuggle Slide. It is the newest major movement glitch found in Breath of the Wild, and it is the one that we will be using to make our way around the world map. Find an object that Link can pick up. Bombs work quite well for this. Face the bomb with your shield out, and then press ZR and A at the same time to pick it up with your bow. 
Jump, press B, and within a couple frames after that, pause the game and unequip your shield. After that, pull back an arrow and cancel it. Link should now be wearing the bomb like a watch. After that, hold B and perform a little step up animation onto a ledge and Link should rocket into the air. From there, you need to keep holding B, but if you wiggle the left control stick, then you can slowly but surely build up Link's speed. We can build up ludicrous amounts of speed with this technique, but we do have a couple of limitations. First off, our height is basically fixed. Second of all, we can't pause the game in any way or dead zone the left control stick because if you do, Link will just fall out of the air. And finally, we of course had to jump to set it up. That being said, I did find a way to perform this without needing the jump. Do the first part where you have the bow and the bomb above your head, and instead of jumping, go ahead and find yourself a nice ramp. We're going to use this ramp to get Link airborne. While he's in the air is when you're going to press B, quickly pause your game, and unequip your shield. And then from there, you can pull back the arrow and do the rest of the trick normally. Unfortunately, there is one problem with this. When we do a BLSS, it typically sends us very far horizontally off of a tall place. And because of that, when the trick ends, we are left high and dry in the air and we don't have the paraglider to save ourselves. Instead, to save ourselves, we're going to call upon the classic Breath of the Wild glitch known as the Fall Damage Cancel. Equip a weapon, a two-handed one works best for this, and hold the R button to wind up Link's throw animation. Before you hit the ground, let go of the R button and quickly unequip your shield to cancel it. This temporarily puts Link into a grounded state which resets our fall distance and allows us to save ourselves after long falls. And with that, we have completely and totally cracked any overworld movement that we would ever need for the entire playthrough. The amazing synergy between the BLSS and the fall damage cancel will allow us to climb all the towers without any real issues by starting in a high place, and then we can just bounce from tower to tower and tower to shrine to unlock all of the shrines. There are 120 shrines in the main game, and this is much too many to include in one video. Now, most of them didn't really have anything special going on in there, so if I don't include them, you can presume that they were completely possible without any real trouble. Of course, not every shrine is normal. There are about 20 or so that require a closer look. For whatever reason, these shrines seem to sort themselves into two groups. We have the easy group, which requires some basic jumpless techniques, sometimes a stasis launch or something, but nothing too bad. And then you have the hard group, which requires some really interesting glitches, some real mental gymnastics, and a lot of time to get done. I'm going to structure this video like a shrine sandwich, where I'm going to start with the easy shrines, and then in the middle I'll do the four divine beasts, and then I'll top it off with the really hard shrines, just to kind of keep it interesting. Before I get started with the easy shrines, I'd like to list a couple things that you'll want to collect during your run. First, we will need 250 or so bomb arrows. Now, I went ahead and collected these from this Boko camp east of the Typhlo ruins. I put down my travel medallion and just came here every time I had a blood moon. Next, we'll need plenty of blue chew jelly. It's pretty easy to find, so I'll leave that to you. Finally, during the course of our run, we make extra certain to not obtain any elemental chew jelly. We need them to be not picked up for a trick later on, so be careful about that. One more thing. For some of the shrines coming up, it helps to have an understanding of the normal strategy for the shrine before I show you the Xless strategy. For clarity's sake, if I'm ever using the X button for a demonstration, I'll go ahead and add this little X button icon to the lower left corner of the screen. If you think that I cheated or broke the rules somehow, just check to see if that X button is there. It might just be demo footage. With all of that explanation out of the way, let's waste no more time and go ahead and start with the easy shrines. If we venture east of the Great Plateau, we eventually come upon Bosch Kala Shrine. The shrine is designed to teach the new player how to use the paraglider and these air currents to get around the place. As we enter the shrine, we are presented with this very large gap and no obvious way to cross it without the glider. Now this might look like a nearly insurmountable challenge right off the bat, but in fact we already have everything we need to beat it. As we enter the shrine and approach that large gap that we need to clear, on the left hand side we can see the first fan, and leading up to it we have a small staircase. We can use the height gain that we get from these stairs to set up a BLSS using the method that I talked about earlier. After that, just use the staircase itself to do the final little step up animation, and the BLSS should carry you between all the obstacles and right to the monk. And that's our first easy shrine.
If you travel to the northeastern part of the Elden region, you will eventually come upon Gut Check Rock, upon which we have Gore Tor Shrine. Although the pedestal is right there, the Goron will not let us access it until we've completed the Gut Check Challenge. The challenge itself consists of climbing from the ground level to the top of Gut Check Rock within 3 minutes and collecting 100 rupees along the way. Now, the normal strategy for this just involves mostly hitting X to make Link jump upwards and then resting on the platforms every now and then to regain our stamina before we start jumping again. And so the question arises, is it possible to clear this challenge without jumping? And the answer is yes if you do some preparation beforehand. I went ahead and grabbed up all of the climbing gear from around Eastern Hyrule, and through trial and error I slowly found the best path to make my way up in time. After arriving at the top in time, and with the necessary amount of rupees, the Goron will go ahead and grant us access to the shrine. The shrine itself is nothing more than a blessing, and therefore poses no further problems for us. I just wanted to mention this one since some people might have wondered if that long climb was possible to do without jumping. After doing all that climbing in the Heat of Death Mountain, we take a trip to Mount Laneru to cool off a little bit. At the top of the mountain we find the Ice Dragon Nadra, who has been corrupted by Ganon's malice and we need to kill all of these malice eyes to free it. After we shoot the first eye, Nadra starts flying around and making updrafts everywhere. We would normally use these updrafts to get bullet time to shoot more of the eyes, but since we can't do that, we will use pieces of the terrain. By this point in my playthrough, I had an ancient bow and I also had three wheels of stamina, so lining up these shots off of the terrain wasn't too bad. After we land the final shot, Nadra cleans itself up and starts flying back up to the top of the mountain. Up there we are rewarded with Nadra's scale that we can use to open up Jitan Sami's shrine. The shrine itself is just another blessing, so no issues there. In the shadow of Death Mountain, south of the Foothill Stable, we find Tamul Shrine. Inside of here we are presented with a new challenge. The shrine's whole gimmick is centered around fire. We start by using fire or some other method to destroy the boxes in this wall. And it is here when we meet the first instance of what I would like to call a minor jump. Normally when you're running the game this jump is so trivial that you don't even notice it, but in this case for us it represents quite the obstacle. It is just slightly too high to blast ourselves over using remote bombs, and there really isn't much else to work with in here. Another thing that we can try is to actually use these ramps to the left and right side of the start to set up a BLSS just like we did in Bosch Kala. And this is possible if not a little bit difficult, but the problem is the BLSS just doesn't quite give us enough height to clear the jump. That being said, it is possible to set down the first bomb, use the second bomb for the BLSS and make our way over to bomb 1, and then set off bomb 1 while we're in the air to finally clear the jump. But, what if I told you there was a much easier and better way to do this? Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the singular most powerful item for this challenge. That's right. This is the humble blue chew jelly, and it will be the undoing of a great many shrines over the course of this run. In fact, it will compose, at least in part, the solutions for no less than 8 of the following shrines. This is the first one. Open your inventory, take out a chew jelly, and throw it on the floor. If you strike it with a weapon, it'll make a nice splash that's capable of putting out fires and getting stuff wet. Now, part of the deal with this splash is that it actually produces a very small hitbox. And if we align Link properly on this hitbox, we can use it to move him around. This leads us to the technique known as the Jelly Bounce. As far as I know, there are two ways to do this, both of which require us to have a one-handed weapon. The easier method I like to refer to as the Reverse Jelly Bounce. Throw a Chew Jelly on the floor and face away from it using a one-handed weapon. Remain facing away from the Chew Jelly and charge up a spin attack. Move slowly towards it and right after Link's back heel intersects with the Chew Jelly is when you need to let go of the attack button. It takes some timing and precision, but eventually we hit the attack just right and it's capable of launching Link pretty high into the air. I am not hitting the jump button in any of these clips, that's just the Chew Jelly doing that. 
After it sends us into the air, you have the option to press the Y button another time to do an extra jump attack to get more height and distance out of the move. The other and more difficult way to perform a jelly bounce I will refer to as the forward jelly bounce. As with before, start with a chew jelly on the ground. Now you're going to put some distance between you and it and then turn around and run forward and smack it with perfect timing with a one-handed dash attack. Because you are sprinting, the timing and precision for this is much tighter. However, it does afford us one very important advantage, and that is that Link is oriented facing forwards. Because of that, we will actually need this version of the Jelly Bounce to perform some tricks later on in the run. Regardless of which method you choose, the minor jump in Tamul is easily cleared with a singular Jelly Bounce, and then there's nothing else to slow us down. Sa Dahaj is something of a sister shrine to Tamul located quite close by. It is another one of those shrines that features boxes in the wall that we need to either blow up or burn, followed by a minor jump that we need to perform. But this time we are armed with the reverse jelly bounce, so they will pose no issues for us anymore. Now, this shrine contains two minor jumps, so it's a little bit more difficult, but it could also represent some good practice if you're trying to learn this for yourself. Once you've cleared the minor jumps, there remains nothing else in the shrine that poses any problems. All you need to do is destroy these two crates and then the spirit orb is yours. Up in the northwestern corner of the map, deep in the Hebra Mountains, we find Rock Uwag Shrine, which is the final one in this series of shrines where we have to like use a bomb or fire or something to destroy the box and then clear a minor jump. I didn't even know that the game had so many of these, but we can actually beat them all the same way with our reverse jelly bounce. After that, the shrine's pretty much normal. You know, you can smack the guardians with the box if you want, it's kind of fun. And then you go ahead and grab up the small key, open the door, and talk to the monk. Not much more to say here, let's move on. If you go into the Gerudo Wasteland region and stand on this hot plate for long enough, you will uncover Jolu Na Shrine, which is the last of the shrines that can be beaten with nothing more than a jelly bounce. The shrine itself is a pretty easy motion control puzzle, but in room 2 we have to get Link onto the button so that we can step on it and hit it with stasis. The easiest way to do this is with a jelly bounce, but if you want I suppose you could blast yourself with a bomb. The rest of the shrine can be cleared more or less normally, where for me normally means whatever weird yet underhanded methods I decide to use that day. I really don't like this motion control thing, so instead I used a couple pumpkins, the flame trap glitch, and magnesis to beat the third puzzle and talk to the monk. With that, we have completed the fourth shrine that requires nothing more than a jelly bounce, and from now on we're going to need to start looking at more complicated techniques. If you explore the area near the Ridgeland Tower, you will undoubtedly soon come across the Thundra Plateau. When we land, the monk instructs us to find the four colored orbs and return them to their pedestals in the center. Thankfully, our inability to jump isn't a huge problem. Although some of the orbs are located high up and we can't climb to get them because it's raining and we can't jump to fight the rain, we can instead just use our bow to shoot them down and then from there use stasis to launch them up onto the platform in the center. Once we are inside the shrine, we are faced with a room of cracked stone blocks under which we have metal boxes that we can use to break them. Now, looking back with 2020 hindsight, perhaps I should have had more of a plan coming into here, but instead I just used my bombs to break a ton of the stone blocks, and then I went and grabbed a metal cube and used it to break a ton more of the stone blocks without really thinking. And before I knew it, I was left down here without any easy way up to the monk to finish the shrine. And so, it's time to turn to an old friend. If you've been a longtime fan of this channel, you know what I'm about to do. I am of course referring to the good old fashioned stasis launch, which doesn't require any jumping. We start by setting a bomb down on the edge of this ramp and carefully setting the box on top of it. From there, we hit it with some stasis and smack it a couple times with a two-handed weapon. After that, we detonate the bomb to redirect the stasis vector, and then carefully and gracefully launch ourselves right over the fence surrounding the monk box and land right next to him. It's pretty cool to me that this challenge forces us to use something as old as the stasis launch in a world where we have BTBs and BLSSs and wind bombs and other new things. I really love this technique, so it's kinda nice that we had a reason to use it again. 
Atop Satori Mountain lies the Mog Latan Shrine. This shrine is all about dynamic platforming and also using magnesis to either set swings into motion or move these spiked metal balls out of the way. This shrine doesn't pose any huge issues until we get to the end, wherein we have these sliding metal boxes that we have to jump in between. This sequence is composed of a set of four minor jumps. And of course, each one of those will require at least one chew jelly to complete. Now, if you want to, using jelly bounces is a perfectly valid solution, but it has a couple issues. First of all, if you ever fall into the void, you'll have to start the whole sequence over again. And second of all, while you're doing the jelly bounces, you're always hitting the metal boxes with your spins and it kind of trashes your weapon. I didn't really feel like tangling with all those chew jelly bounces, so instead I turned to a trick that I knew back from my days of speedrunning shrines like this. About halfway through the shrine we have this drawbridge looking thing, and it's about perfectly placed so that if you stand in the right place you can get a really good stasis launch that sends us all the way to the end. You know the drill, hit it with stasis and charge it to max with a two-handed weapon. I used a bow spin. From there drop a bomb over the side and detonate it to redirect the vector upwards. Now positioning Link at the point of that diamond, when the stasis timer ends the bridge flips up and launches us over the entire shrine. Now, usually when I perform this trick, I end up all the way at the end by the monk, but for whatever reason this time I ended up a little bit short. But that's nothing a bomb and some magnesis can't fix. By the wetland stable, we find Kaya Wan Shrine, which will be your final easy shrine. Normally, the puzzle is composed of using Cryonis to scale a couple waterfalls and stuff, and then riding this raft and using it to glide to the end over by the monk. To get through the first part, we have a minor jump that we need to do, so we're going to put down a chew jelly on the ice cube and use it to get up. Finally, as we make our way towards the end, we need to find a way to avoid gliding off this raft towards the monk. Once again, I elected just to use a stasis launch and ride the raft like a magic carpet down the hall and to the end. And that concludes the final easy shrine. From now on, every shrine we do will be a lot harder. Let's take a break with shrines for now and begin with the four divine beasts, starting with divine beast Va Naboris. We make our way to Gerudo Town, where we find divine beast Va Naboris causing a ruckus and stirring up sandstorms everywhere. The Gerudo chief Riju tasks us with first finding her thunder helm to prove that we're worthy to take on the divine beast. If we ask around, we find out that the Thunderhelm was stolen by the Yiga clan, so we're gonna make our way over to their base and go steal it back. At this point, I already had a shrine by the Yiga base, so I went ahead and just warped there and then made my way inside. Now, normally, and especially with our jump button condition, the Yiga clan hideout is best approached with stealth. After all, if you ever take a direct hit from a Blade Master in here, you will just straight up die. Armor, hearts, fairies, even Mipha's grace, doesn't matter. However, I am really bad at sneaking in this game. I'm not really sure why, it's just kind of one of the things that I never really learned how to do very well. It feels like every time I try it in here, I just like don't really get the sneak strike prompt to show up and then the enemy turns around and sees me and the whole battle starts. And so, I really didn't try all that hard to sneak around this place. Eventually the Yiga clan just noticed me anyway, and I had to fight my way out of the second room with just good old fashioned swords and shields and parries and stuff. Now, in the second room, I think we have like six blade masters coming after us, and our fighting is hampered quite a bit because we can't flurry rush or jump to cancel any attack animations. So as a result, I spent quite a lot of time just sprinting around to make sure that I didn't have a Blade Master teleporting in behind me. And on the rare occasion that you do get a good chance to stand and fight, you gotta just kind of remain confident, stand your ground, and parry at the right time. Not much more you can do. Regardless, it was enough for us to finally clear the second room of the Yiga clan without getting killed. After that, we clap Koga real quick and win the Thunderhelm back. We make our way back to Gerudo Town, give the helm back to Riju, and then we have to watch the entire memory because we can't skip it. After that, she tells us to meet her at the outpost. Once we make our way over there with a BLSS, we climb the ladder and prepare for the fight. In the fight against Von Naboris, you need to shoot at its feet with bomb arrows. 
Riju gives us 20 of these, and as I mentioned before, we're hoarding them like a dragon, so go ahead and equip a multi-shot bow. In a perfect world, you can clear this fight with 4 bomb arrows and pocket the remaining 16. And I actually managed to do that this time. I was pretty proud of myself. Normally I have a lot of trouble micromanaging the lightning and the seal and Riju going everywhere, but in this case I couldn't have really asked for a much better Noboris battle. And so, with a glorious 16 bomb arrow profit and the battle complete, we are allowed to enter the dungeon part of Divine Beast of Noboris. And, to be completely honest, I think that there's something of a community consensus that this is one of the harder Divine Beasts, but knowing how to do it already, for the purposes of this challenge, it's actually one of the easier ones. As always, we begin the dungeon by getting the map so that we can rotate the central cylinder. From there, we can activate the terminals in whichever order we so choose. And I am pleased to say that four of the five terminals are pretty easy to get normally. You know, you connect all the circuits and do the normal electric stuff, and you can get the terminals without jumping. After all, this is more of an electric puzzle rather than a height-based puzzle. The one terminal that does require a close look is the one raised up high in the central barrel. Normally to get this one, I like to try to glide down from a high place, but in this case you can just place Link inside of this weird spine thing, rotate the central column, and get your way on top, and then just run over to the terminal and activate it pretty easily. Once we are done activating the fifth terminal, it's now time to make our way to the main control unit, and I'm sure you guys know what happens next. We stand face to face with Thunderblight, and we need to find a way to beat him without using the jump button to dodge or flurry rush. For the most part, this fight comes down to just standing your ground and parrying, like what we did with the Yiga clan. Although Thunderblight managed to connect the first hit of the battle, here's how the rest of it went. Those guardian weapons hit like a truck. Let's use them to go hunt down a big lizard. Our next order of business is Divine Beast Varudanya. Now, I already started this quest line, so Yunobu is currently trapped in the cave in the abandoned North Mine. Conveniently for us, I already had a shrine up here, so I'm going to use the shrine itself to set up a BLSS so that we can safely float our way over to the North Mine, drop onto the cannon, and use it to free Yanobo. From there, we just use the cannon to blow up the rocks in the cave entrance. Next, we need to make our way across this lava to get over to Yanobo to talk to him and start the cutscene. So, we'll just set up another BLSS using this geometry by the cannon to float our way over the lava and go ahead and talk to Yanobo. After that cutscene, Yanobo rolls back onto Goron City and we're going to follow him there and talk to Bluto. Bluto tells us that Yanobo went back to the Bridge of Elden to start the fight against Varudanya, but we find him trapped by these moblins. After rescuing him, we can use him to lower the bridge with the cannon and we can begin the ascent sequence. Now, the ascent up the mountain doesn't really change all that much as a result of this challenge. Sure, you're not allowed to use the glider on the later parts, and our climbing is slowed down quite a bit when we can't jump, but if you manage to get your hands on one of these metal boxes, you can just grab it with Magnesis and use it to just trash all the drones flying around. And for any that are out of range of Magnesis, you can just climb up and throw bombs at them from above. Seriously, this section of the game is pretty long and boring, and the conditions of this challenge don't really make it all that more exciting. That's why I'm skipping most of it. And while I'm on it, let me know in the comments if you guys would like me to upload some of the raw footage of any of these shrines or divine beasts, I would be happy to do so. As of now, I don't really have plans to upload most of the footage, some of it I want to though, but my academic schedule is pretty tight right now, I'm finishing my master's degree, so I'm trying to keep my self-imposed workload to a minimum. But, if you really want to see a specific shrine or divine beast in its entirety, then let me know. 
Anyway, after smacking the lizard a third and final time with our Goron friend, he retreats up to Death Mountain. Let's go ahead and get started with the dungeon. Welcome to Divine Beast Varudanya. As always, we are tasked with first finding and downloading the map and then activating the five terminals around the interior of the Divine Beast. However, this time we're going to do things a little bit out of order and I'm going to get Terminal 1 before the map. As soon as we enter the Divine Beast, the shutters close behind us and we are thrust into darkness. However, that's not really a huge issue for us. To the right of the main entryway behind this door we have Terminal 1. We use a bomb to clear this crossbeam out of the way and then we can use Magnesis to get the terminal well before collecting the map. After that, we start lighting all the torches and blowing up all the malasai so that we can slowly make our way to the other end of the beast and obtain the map. With the map downloaded, we now have the ability to change the gravity in here by 90 degrees. Careful manipulation of the gravity in here will be the key to avoiding all the normal jumps and glides that you would need to activate the five terminals. For instance, Terminal 2 is located on this platform surrounded by a pit that we can't easily access. With the gravity sideways, we can stand here on this long diagonal crossbeam that spans the Divine Beast and carefully drop down and use a fall damage cancel to safely land right in front of the terminal. Terminal 3 is basically normal. We use a blue fire-tipped arrow to shoot through this eyeball-shaped door and light up the torch. And then from there, we burn a hole in the ceiling to get access to this metal cube, which we can use to block the flamethrower so that we can get access to Terminal 3. After that, the next thing that we want to do is go ahead and grab a torch, ignite it with the blue fire, and walk up the main diagonal crossbeam and head outside so that we can use it to light up the torch and unlock the shrine ball. Now, my original plan was to go ahead and get the terminal on the lizard's spine while I was already out here unlocking the shrine ball, but things played out a little bit differently. To get to the terminal on the spine, we need to get up this rather tall ledge and we don't have any way to jump. I can't use a jelly bounce either because it will turn into flame jelly out here and those aren't useful for a jelly bounce. So I tried to kind of walk Link around the edge while rotating gravity and hope that I could sort of walk my way around. Unfortunately, it didn't go well, I fell off and went back to the start of the dungeon. However, as I made my way back inside to try that move again, I found that I had inadvertently caused a happy little accident to occur. While I had been messing with gravity outside, I had inadvertently caused the shrine ball to roll down to the end of the diagonal beam and from there we could use Magnesis to free it, put it in the receptacle, and open and activate Terminal 4. After that, I made my way back outside and took a more circuitous yet more successful route on the lizard's spine to finally make my way to Terminal 5. From there, it's a pretty easy and quick drop down to the center of the lizard so that you can activate the main control unit. And of course, our next task is to beat up Fireblight. Not only do we have the parry skills we learned from clapping the entire Yiga clan with no stealth, but we also have Urbosa's Fury because we already beat up Thunderblight. Compared to that, Fireblight is just a big flaming disappointment. And with that, we have completed the first half of our run. We still have the entire list of hard shrines as well as two Divine Beasts remaining. Let's go ahead and waste no more time and head into Divine Beast Varuta. I've already progressed the Varuta questline quite a bit. I have the shock arrows I need, so without further ado, it's time to ride on Sidon. And this battle is a little bit unique because I'll be able to use it to showcase one of the rare instances that we get to enjoy the use of the paraglider. As always, the battle begins with Varuda using its powers to shoot a bunch of ice at us, which will just break with Cryonis as normal. After that, Sidon takes us in on the offensive and we can press A at the base of the waterfall to swim up it using our Zora armor. And at the top, something miraculous occurs. The power of the Zora armor enables Link to remember that this whole time he's had this wonderful paraglider in his pocket. And we can use this to get two shots off on Ruda with each climb and we get to enjoy this free of charge without a single use of the X button. Now I know what you might be thinking, the thumbnail of this video said that it was a no glide challenge but you just pulled out the glider. And I suppose if I really wanted to, I could just put it away instantly, but the game kind of threw us a bone here and I'm inclined to accept it because things will get really, really nasty later on. Seriously, it's more of a waste of time than anything else to put away the glider here and I'm really more focused on the X button itself. Since it still remains unpressed, I'm okay with it. Anyway, after another couple well-placed shock arrows, the fight is over and we are now ready to enter Divine Beast Varuta. 
Welcome to the interior of the Divine Beast. As with the Lizard, we're going to start with getting the first terminal since it's right there to the right of the entrance. After that, we destroy some Malice Eyes and then make our way towards the map using Cryonis. Once that's taken care of, we're going to turn around and head upstairs and make our way towards Terminal 2, which we can solve normally using Cryonis yet again. Terminal 3 can also be activated pretty much normally. All you need to do is hit this Shrine Ball with Stasis at the right time, and then you can pretty much just walk in and activate it. Unfortunately for us, this is where the easy part ends. Our next target is Terminal 4, which lies at the end of Varuda's trunk. Normally, all you would need to do is just lower the trunk and then you could glide down to get it, but we're going to need to think of something else. Our first step is to kind of abuse the map and rapidly alternate raising and lowering the trunk so that we can sort of walk link around the side here and get as much height as we possibly can. Now we can't get to the top, but we can drop down onto the elephant's head. After that, we're going to lower the trunk back to the bottom and we're going to use this geometry on the side here to set up a BLSS. This BLSS will enable us to float all the way over to the end of the trunk and then we can land on the terminal while it's all the way down. And then as the final step, we can just raise the trunk back up so that the terminal raises into place for us to activate it. And thankfully, as a convenient side effect of this move, we are now in a position where we're way high up above the head of the elephant. This allows us to easily drop down into position, enter the head of the elephant, and start going for Terminal 5, which is surrounded by these flaming jets. To put them out, we're first going to destroy this Malice Eye, and then we're going to use Magnesis to open up the door so that we can get water into here. From there, all we need to do is set the trunk in the right position and wait for the water to do the rest. And with that, we have at last activated all of the terminals. Let's waste no more time and head back towards the back of the elephant and activate the central control unit. It's now time to fight Water Blight, and that battle goes about how you would expect it to. This completes Divine Beast Va Ruta. Let's waste no more time and start working on Va Meadow, which will be the hardest Divine Beast because it is a wind dungeon. We proceed from the flight range where we find Teba tuning his bow preparing to take on Va Meadow on his own. We offer him our flightless services in taking down the Divine Beast. Teba is willing to accept our help on the condition that we can prove our archery prowess at the flight range. He tasks us to use our paraglider to ride around the updrafts in the flight range and use our bow and arrow to take out 5 targets in 3 minutes. Now, for whatever reason, Teba must be a very easily impressed birdman, or maybe he just doesn't really care about our well-being, because if we want to, we can just stand here and shoot all the targets from this starting deck without needing to enter the air at all. As goofy as it may seem, it is good enough for us, and that's what this challenge is all about. Anyway, as we prepare to fly up to take on Va Meadow, Teba is extremely generous and gives us another set of 20 bomb arrows. And unlike with Naboris, this time we're going to pocket every single one. To show you how, let's waste no more time and cut right to the fight against Divine Beast Va Meadow. The Divine Beast is armed with four cannons. Each cannon periodically charges and shoots guardian beams at Link or Teba, and the battle will end when all of them are destroyed. Normally the game directs you to shoot at these with bomb arrows, but in fact they can be damaged by anything, even swords and stuff. And I found out that ancient arrows actually destroy them in a single hit, whereas bomb arrows require two. And so, at a minimum, if you're willing to spend four to six ancient arrows depending on your accuracy, we can save at least eight bomb arrows during the fight. This may sound like a raw deal, but I can actually make as many ancient arrows as I want at Robbie's tech lab, whereas I can no longer buy bomb arrows because I have more than 50 of them. Also, here's another fun fact about this battle. As soon as you press through the text to get off Teba's back, the game forces the glider open for you. Once again, the game has given us a single use of the paraglider without needing to press the X button, and just as in the Varuda fight, I'm going to gratefully accept it. We're going to exploit that single use of the glider to slowly float our way over and make our way close to a cannon. From there, you pull out your ancient arrow, aim the shot, and hope for the best. If you land your shot anywhere on the cannon, it will go down. And so will Link, actually. We have no way to open the glider again, so we're going to just fall out of the sky. However, Teba is an absolute dilf and will catch us every single time we fall. And so we can just cycle this process as many times as we need until the fight is over. 
find your way over to a cannon with the glider, use your single shot with the ancient arrow to take it down, fall and get caught by Teba and start again. The one annoying thing about all of this is that Teba will actually drop you off at the same location with respect to the Divine Beast, so you're going to spend quite a lot of time just gliding around getting to the next cannon you want to shoot. Because of that, the most efficient way to do this fight is to snipe the cannons from far away using an Ancient Bow. However, even with the Ancient Bow, I still managed to miss one of my arrows, and so I fell below the Divine Beast and had to cycle it again. But hey, the time loss from that fall actually resulted in the battle going on a little bit longer, and because of that we got this spectacular shot of the Blood Moon over Teba and me. Anyway, after we land a clean hit on the fourth and final cannon, the barrier falls and we're finally free to enter the dungeon part of this divine beast. As I mentioned before, Vameto is a dungeon centered on wind puzzles, and as a result of that they usually require the glider, so we're going to need to use our head a little bit to get through this one. I want you to think of Va Meadow as the midterm exam for the jumpless BLSS, because you will need it a lot in here. Welcome to the most difficult Divine Beast during this run. Now, a large part of this Divine Beast involves heavy abuse of the map, so the first thing we're going to do is cross this pit in the middle to go collect it. We're going to use Magnesis on these sliding blocks to line them up so that Link can walk over the diagonal in between them. After that, we get access to the map, which is great because we're going to really need it this time. As always, it is now time to start seeking out the dungeon's five terminals. There are two terminals on the right wing of the dungeon, and three on the left. As it so happens, for whatever reason, the ones on the right wing are much easier to get, so we're going to go ahead and start there. Head back towards the center of the dungeon, drop down to the lower level, and head outside towards the right wing. Out there we have this gondola looking thing hanging from the wing that we can use. After destroying the malice eye on the other side, all we need to do is step into the gondola, tilt the bird, and gravity will do the rest. From there, Terminal 1 is just a short walk upstairs. Terminal 2 is basically normal as well. All you need to do is do the normal stuff with the magnesis and the wind, and then just tilt the bird, let the cylinder slide into place, and you can activate it pretty easily but this is where the easy part of the dungeon ends. Our next order of business is to quickly tilt the bird again and make our way back towards the center so that we can approach the left wing and its three terminals. There is nothing useful on the lower level of the left wing, so as we make our way over to the left side of the dungeon, we're going to need to make sure that we don't drop down to the lower level. Once again, this requires some precise use of these metal blocks in the middle, and we're also going to need to tilt the bird quite a bit so that we can slide the stone blocks into place to make a safe path across. It's kinda hard to explain the exact process that I used, so I'm just gonna go ahead and show you the footage. And with that, we have safely made it into the left wing. Our next target is going to be Terminal 3, which is located in that alcove on the left hand side, a decent distance off the floor. At this point, it's time to set up our first jumpless BLSS inside of the dungeon. We have this really nice and generous sized ramp on the right hand side, so we can use it as many times as we need until we get the bomb and the bow above Link's head like this. To finish the trick, we do the final step up on this small piece of geometry on the left hand side. And if you do the trick properly, it should rocket us at a perfect angle to fly across the room and land right on Terminal 3. With Terminal 3 activated, let's start looking at Terminal 4, which is on the other side of that red barrier. Now you can do it normally, that's perfectly fine, but I decided to go ahead and practice my BLSS some more. While I'm showcasing that, I'd also like to take the chance to mention why I am using the square bomb for this. You see, the square bomb, and every other carryable object for that matter, have different momentum properties when you use them for a BLSS. I'm not exactly sure of all the precise nuances here, but in my experience the square bomb is A, easier to pick up, and B, offers a slower, more controlled BLSS experience. 
And so the square bomb is ill suited towards overworld movement where you want to move fast, but it's pretty nicely suited for indoor cramped movement like this where you need a high amount of control. I am well aware that the majority of you are just going to watch this video for fun and not really try to replicate anything in it, and that's perfectly fine, but if you are interested in this sort of thing, I strongly suggest that you test out the BLSS for yourself with a couple of different objects. It's quite an interesting experience. But that being said, we now have 4 out of 5 terminals, but if you'll remember, the last one is the most difficult because it is the one on the underside of the wing directly below us right now. The game just gave us an autosave after Terminal 4, so we're going to start by loading that to send Link back to the start of the dungeon. Believe it or not, our next step to get below the left wing is to actually get on top of the right wing. Once again, we call upon our trusty friend, the BLSS, which we can use this ramp back here to set up. Now, because we're outside on Va Meadow, it's pretty windy, so we're going to use the Malice to hold the bomb in place so that we can pick it up and then proceed with the rest of the setup. Because we're back outside and we don't really need to be as controlled this time, I went ahead and used the round bomb because it's a lot faster. Even so, I'm still pretty bad at the BLSS wiggle because my left thumb just gets tired kind of fast so it takes us a little while to get over here. Regardless, this is how we're going to get on top of the bird without using the updrafts. Now while I'm up here, I decided to leave the bird tilted. In front of Link right now, we have this long edge going up the bird's wing. And this long edge is pretty great for us because we can use it to perform a step up animation at any point along it. Because the bird is tilted, this translates into us being able to start a BLSS from quite a decent range of height values. It's pretty difficult to change our height once we're already sliding around, so it's quite nice for us that the game gave us some freedom to choose our starting height. Once we perform that step up from the right point on the wing, it's now just a matter of slowly adjusting Link's X and Y position to carefully make our way towards the terminal under the left wing. Again, while I'm floating around out here, I wanted to remind you guys that I've never really tangled much with the BLSS before this video. Sure, I tried it a bit back when it was discovered, but this is the first time I've used it so much. And it's a really strange trick to try to control. There's this like weird speed fluctuation that you get depending on which way Link is facing. It's very strange and you should see it for yourself. And so my movements aren't very precise, for which I apologize. But nonetheless, they seem to be good enough to make our way under the left wing and activate the final terminal of the dungeon. Now, we've done a good job to get this far, but when you think about it, we're actually quite trapped right now and we need to find our way back to the main part of the dungeon. Now, we have this huge gap that stands between us and it, and so the best way to get back there is to just load our save that we got after the final terminal. From here, we're going to need to once again find our way from the start of the dungeon to the top of the wings. And at this point, you guys already know the drill. We're going to use this ramp over here by the start to set up one final BLSS, and we're going to just slide our way on top of the bird for the last time. After that, things proceed more or less normally. You know, you land on the bird, go over, you talk to the garlic, and then here's Windblight. Now, phase one of this fight was actually pretty goofy for me, because if you just run up under Windblight, you're safe from most forms of damage because his gun is so comically big that he can't shoot you with it. After wailing on him a bit with our Guardian Sword, we begin Phase 2, where Windblight likes to float around off the ground quite a bit more. You can shoot him in the head with your bow if you want, but I also wanted to use this cool stick I got at Robbie's place. With that, we are done with our most difficult and final Divine Beast. A reward is an ability that we will never use once. It's now time to move on towards the most difficult shrines on the map as well as the end of the run. I have six of these for you today. Each one of them presents a unique problem and each one of them will be solved with a unique solution. Without further ado, let's get right on to the most interesting part of this run. In the Tabantha region, on the far western edge of the map, located in this cave in the ground, we find the Ka Okeo Shrine. And as we venture into the shrine, we once again meet our arch nemesis for this challenge, a long vertical wind dungeon. 
Most of the shrine is centered around using the Korok Leaf or other methods to generate wind gusts so that you can move around fans and balloons and stuff. Now this part doesn't actually pose a problem for a little while, but when we get to the later half of the shrine we are met with a massive vertical room and we have to access a small key at the top of it to open this locked door to get to the monk. One way or another, we're not going to be able to get through this shrine unless we can A find some way to get up to the small key without using the glider, or B find some way to get to the monk without even needing to get the small key. I mean seriously, just look at what we're dealing with here. That being said, the shrine does actually give us an awful lot of things to work with. For example, in this first main room, you have a bunch of guardians and you also have this square platform with four balloons on it that we can use. Normally, we would just use this platform with the Korok leaf to get ourselves to the other side of the room, but in our case we're going to take it in a slightly different direction. As the platform bobs up and down, you want to carefully stasis it when it's in the lower part of its cycle. From there, we can charge it to maximum with a single bomb. And here's when the interesting part happens. We're going to get the attention of one of the guardians down there, and we're going to use his laser blast to actually get us a perfectly vertical stasis vector. After that comes the precise part. Before we launch, you want to position Link perfectly in the dead center of the platform so that you have the vector going through his head. As we take off, if you walk Link very slowly forward, not enough to tilt the platform but enough to move over towards that wall, you'll have just enough height and distance to make it on top of the wall. And then from there you can just carefully navigate your way around to the monk box. Now that was a bit of a strange trick, and of course I had to slow it down quite a bit so that I could get in all the commentary that I wanted to because the stasis timer is so short. So I'm gonna go ahead and play it in full speed for you guys just so that you can get a sense of the timing of everything. And with that, we have conquered our first difficult shrine. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Inside this rock surrounded by lava in the heat of Death Mountain, we find the Shora Ha Shrine, and this is one of the longer shrines the game has to offer. The shrine's whole gimmick is this blue Sheikah fire. We will need the fire to clear up obstacles and open gates and whatnot as we make our way from the start of the shrine to the end. Unsurprisingly, because of the length of this dungeon, we do have a couple obstacles that we will encounter that require us to use our advanced jumpless techniques. First of all, to even get to the first torch with the blue flame on it, you need to climb up these two minor jumps, and by now you know how we're going to do this. After that, once we've gotten our hands on the blue flame and we have a torch in our inventory, the next part of the dungeon proceeds more or less normally. We can use the long range of our ancient bow to connect a shot all the way from this torch to the torch over in the corner so that we can skip the first part of the dungeon. This isn't necessary at all, of course you can do it normally if you feel like it, but doing it this way allows us to save quite a bit of time, and as you'll see later on, we're going to do some tricks that are quite hard and prone to many repetitions, so if you want to ever load your save, you're going to have to find a way to get back upstairs quickly. As we make our way upstairs, we're going to deal with the spiked ball with Magnesis, and then use it to clear out the guardians on the platform ahead of us. From there, you can use the blue flame that we shot over here to light the torch over in the corner of the platform so that we can open the gate and keep moving forward. The gate after that is also pretty easy to deal with, all you need to do is line up an arrow shot to get these two torches lit simultaneously. But after that, we finally reach the problem part of the shrine. Ahead of us we see two moving platforms, both of which have a torch on top of them. If we use another arrow shot to light both of these torches simultaneously, the platforms will stop moving and will have updrafts turn on that we're supposed to use to glide over to the other side. And of course, I probably don't need to explain why this poses a certain difficulty for us. There's quite a decent horizontal gap between each platform, and in addition to that, on the final jump we also have quite a large height difference that we need to conquer. Now, the first two gaps can be crossed with two jelly bounces, but the whole situation is far from ideal. 
First off, you need quite a good chew jelly bounce to actually clear the jump. Second of all, this is a sequence of chew jelly jumps without any stable ground in between. Therefore, if you fail one of them and fall into the lava, you'll have to start the whole sequence over. Additionally, we have to actually deal with the side effects of using chew jelly to do these jumps. As you saw, once we lit the torches, the platform stopped moving, so if we do something to put the torches out, the platforms will start moving again. Because of this, if you're too close to one of the lit torches when you do your spin attack onto the chew jelly, it will cause the platform to start moving again and you might miss your target. But in reality, none of this really matters for us at all. The third jump has this massive height gain that we need to somehow get over off of a piece of chew jelly. Now perhaps this is possible, but if it is, it's more precise than I can manage. So let's put that chew jelly plan on the back burner and look around the shrine and see if we have anything else to work with. One thing we can try is we can go back to that ramp with the spiky ball on it earlier and attempt to use it to set up a BLSS. Unfortunately, this doesn't help us at all. We don't have the height that we need to actually get over the gap. We can't even get on top of one of the platforms, so it's actually less of a viable plan than just using the chew jelly. I suppose you could also try to somehow stasis launch off of the spiky ball, but the problem is once you lose it, it's gone forever, and the other thing is spiked objects really don't work well for stasis launches in my experience. And so the question arises, what in the world are we going to do to complete the shrine? And the answer to that question is actually something that I haven't explored yet in this video. The first part of the shrine will proceed as normally. We're going to use our two jelly bounces to get up those minor jumps onto the magnetic block so that we can get access to the blue fire. And then from there, I went ahead and used my ancient bow's range to get the flame all the way to the other end of the room so that we could skip the first part of the dungeon. After that, we begin our long ascent. From there, we will proceed through the dungeon as normally. We soon arrive at the part of the dungeon with the two torches that you're supposed to light with an arrow. And at this point, instead of doing the chew jelly jump sequence or somehow setting up a stasis launch or BLSS or anything, we're going to do this. That's right. Despite our jumpless limitations and everything, we can still find a way to put together a wind bomb. And this was something of a move of desperation because I really didn't expect this one to be possible. I figure at this point the grand majority of you have seen a wind bomb before, but I'll briefly explain it for those who haven't. The general idea is that if you can find a way to be in bullet time and get the two bombs lined up with Link like this, then you can set off the bomb in the back to push the bomb in the front forwards into Link and cause him to launch. There is of course much more detail in performing this trick than what I mentioned, but that's beyond the scope of this video. All you need to know is that the wind bomb technique typically consists of two X presses. We use one to set up the bombs and get them in the right place while we're in bullet time, and then we use the second one to open the glider so that we can control our landing. Without the X button, we have to perform a somewhat lackluster version of this technique, where instead of a jump, we're going to use a piece of chew jelly to get the bombs in the right position, and instead of gliding to control our descent, we're just going to pray that Link goes the right way. And believe me when I tell you that this is much, much harder to perform than a normal wind bomb. In order to get the bombs oriented properly, you have to use a forward jelly bounce. That means that we'll need to do a dash attack onto the chew jelly, which is a lot more precise than doing the backward spin. Because of that, it's already a lot harder to get the maximum height out of the chew jelly, but we kind of need that to get the bombs in the right position. Additionally, the timing for placing the bombs is quite nasty as well. And then, as if all of this wasn't bad enough, if you're a little bit off on your angle because you did your dash attack wrong, Link will just fly off in the wrong direction even if you do get the launch to work. Even though I already know how to do wind bombs pretty consistently, it took me several hours just to land this trick once. But that is all we need, and with that we have completed Shora Ha Shrine. In Kakariko Village, we encounter the Talo Neg Shrine. At the start of the game, the king kind of directs you to come this way right after finishing the Great Plateau. And so, the shrine itself is designed as something of a tutorial to teach the beginner player the basic combat techniques in Breath of the Wild. 
As we enter the shrine, we encounter this one-of-a-kind crystalline guardian. The monk instructs us to use a side hop to start a flurry rush to attack the guardian. And of course, as you know, that is not allowed for us. Now, unlike most enemies in Breath of the Wild, this guardian appears to be hard-coded so that you can only damage it by performing the exact technique the monk asks you to do. Believe me, I tried all sorts of different ways that I know to deal damage in this game, and this guy shrugged off all of them. I tried normal sword swings, bomb arrows, ancient arrows, I even tried using a piece of elemental chew jelly even though I said that I'm not allowed to use that during this run, but regardless of anything I threw at him, the guardian just shrugged it all off. Although I didn't even test this, I'd be willing to bet that even if you hacked a one-hit obliterator into this fight, the guardian just wouldn't care. So, what options do we really have to beat the shrine? Well, we could keep looking around and see if there's some way to damage the guardian, but I find that to be very unlikely. The only other option I can really see is to somehow get Link to clip or otherwise move himself to the other side of the gate that's locked behind the guardian fight. So let's go ahead and take a look at the wall separating this room from the monk's room and see if we can find any way to get in. Now, if you've watched an All Shrine speedrun, you're no doubt familiar with the strategy of using a shield skew clip to get through this wall. Again, I'm going to deliver a brief explanation for those who don't know what this is. If you perform a shield surf on a sloped surface and have Link put away his shield like this, then the game will store the angle of that surface. This angle is known as Link's skew angle. If we then perform another shield flip and unequip our shield in midair, then Link will snap back to his skew angle for two frames. It is during this brief window of time that Link has the power to clip through walls. However, we can't clip through any wall with this technique. In reality, this works best if your wall is pretty vertical and not very rough. In addition, it helps if the compass heading of Link's skew angle matches the compass heading of the face of the wall that you're trying to clip through. Another thing to note is that the skew angle in memory will actually persist until we override it by doing another shield flip that lands on the ground. So if you want, you can take the skew angle from one place on the map and then either warp or load your save and bring it somewhere else to perform your clip. Now normally, performing a shield skew clip actually requires two uses of the X button, one to store the skew and then the second to activate it and clip through the wall. However, the X button itself isn't really that important for this. All it's used for is to get Link off the ground so that we can perform the shield surf. Because of that, if we can find another way to get Link off the ground, then we can still do this trick. Enter the blue chew jelly yet again. We can use a backwards jelly bounce to set up our skew, but to actually activate it, it's best to use a forward jelly bounce because you want Link to be oriented the right way. So, knowing all of this, let's head back into Talo Neg and see if we can actually clip our way through that wall so that we don't have to fight the Guardian. Now, if you've ever watched a speedrun of all shrines, you probably know where the weak point in this wall is. And in fact, it is actually this post right by the gate. If we store our skew ahead of time, then we can perform a standard shield skew technique to get inside of this post. Now, walls in this game are actually double-sided, so we'll need to perform a second shield skew to get out of the post and go over to the monk. Unfortunately, this actually causes a problem for us. We can use our jelly bounce skew clip to get in there just fine, but once we're inside the post, we find out that it just barely has enough space to contain Link. And as a result, we're unable to hold items in there, which means that we can't put a chew jelly down so we won't be able to actually escape the post with a second clip because we have no way to leave the ground. So since the post by the door is a non-starter, let's instead turn our sights towards this fence over here. Now, it might not look like it, but this fence actually, in my experience, is impossible to clip through with a standard shield skew. And the reason is because it's actually composed of two planes of geometry very close to each other. Although you can clip through the first plane, the second one will actually collide with Link and push him out of the wall. When I attempt to do my normal skew through it, you can actually see the frame where Link is briefly occupying the small space between the two planes of geometry. This is indicated when the camera zooms way into the fence. So how are we supposed to tackle this? Well, we actually do have a technique for situations like this, and it is known as the Extended Shield Clip. 
All you need to do is perform a normal shield skew clip, and on the second frame of skew when Link is snapping into the wall, you're going to re-equip your shield and quickly hit ZL and A as the menu closes to get on your shield again. If you do everything right, this should increase the clipping time of the technique and actually enable Link to clip through more difficult walls. Fortunately for us, this is actually powerful enough to get us through the fence in Talo Neg. Of course, we just need to find a way to do it without jumping. As I mentioned before, we can get our skew anywhere and bring it into Talo Neg, so we're going to start our run actually in Monyatoma. This shrine works nicely for us because in the back we have this large pillar decoration thing that has the right slope and compass heading to match the fence that we need to clip through. Because the face of it is so big, it allows us to compensate for the inaccuracy of using a jelly bounce to set it up. When I did this run, I already had a save file inside of Talo Neg, so we're going to just load that and bring the skew into there. So now the time has come to put together everything that we have learned and get through the wall. For the last time, we find ourselves faced with the impossible Crystalline Guardian, and this time we're going to run right by him and start setting up our forward jelly bounce. There is not much more to explain here, so I will leave you with this. That's one more shrine completed. Talo Neg was the first shrine that we had to actually start somewhere else, store some value in memory, and bring it in to complete the shrine. And this will be the case for every remaining shrine on this list. Let's move right along to the next one. Outside of the Rito flight range, we find the shrine Sha Warvo. Let's go ahead and venture inside and see what the shrine has in store for us. Once again, we encounter the grand arch nemesis for this challenge, a long vertical wind dungeon. This is actually the most vertical shrine in the game. We have these fans pointing upward that you have to ride on using your glider. Now, even with the most perfect glider control in the world, this shrine still demands four uses out of the X button at a minimum. Normally, we would need our first two presses to jump and glide on the fan at the ground level, from there move our way up and transfer over to a couple of other updrafts on higher platforms and then try to land on the small moving platform to get our way over to the ladder. After we top out the ladder, we need to use our other two X presses to jump and glide on this fan, follow the route around the side to find the hidden fan to finally make our way up to the monk. Needless to say, at first glance, this shrine looks really, really bad for us. Every single jumpless technique that we've worked to cultivate so far just falls short. The one that maybe shows a little bit of promise would be to somehow get a wind bomb. However, getting a wind bomb off of a piece of chew jelly is really difficult actually, and what's even more difficult is trying to control the wind bomb so that you land somewhere useful. Even if I cheat and jump to set up the wind bomb as I'm doing in this clip, because I'm not allowed to open the glider later on, I just slide right off the platform even if I do go in the right direction. Needless to say, the chances of me managing to do this 5 or 6 times in a row to get up to the monk are basically zero. And so, having run out of options, we will have to seek out another glitch to help us. Let's take a break from Shawarvo and head over to Hateno Village. When we land, we're going to go ahead and head into the Myamagana Shrine. The first thing that we do in here is save our game. The shrine puzzle itself is trivial, and I already solved it off camera because it's nothing special, but what is special is that the shrine itself has this motion control apparatus inside of it. This may sound surprising, but using the camera rune in tandem with this apparatus will allow us to make the game misbehave in some very strange ways. We get close to the apparatus with our shield out, and then from there we're going to crouch and hit the L button to open the camera at the same time. If you do it right, you should be able to take a photo and interact with the apparatus in the same A-press. After that, we delete the photo, quickly pause the game, and load the save. Once the save is done loading, you're going to just do that exact same sequence again. I'm not sure why you need to do it again, I don't really know anything about how this glitch works, but I know what it allows us to do and we're going to need it. 
we just performed one version of a glitch known as apparatus storage. Apparatus storage, in and of itself, is not extremely useful, but it is somewhat of a gateway glitch that will allow us to do interesting things afterwards. To show you what I mean, let's head over to Kwa Raim Shrine in Death Mountain. As soon as we land, we notice that something is out of the ordinary. I don't have on any flame breaker armor or a fire potion, and yet Link is perfectly fine in Death Mountain. As we will soon see, apparatus storage has weird effects on how the weather of the local area affects Link. Another interesting thing is that our glider is completely broken and just kind of falls like a rock, but of course that isn't really a problem for us for obvious reasons. While we're here, we're going to dip Link's feet in the lava. This may sound a bit goofy, but we actually just put the game into a state known as Death Mountain Anywhere. Let's go over to the Great Plateau and I'll show you how it works. Essentially, when you activate Death Mountain Anywhere, you are taking the effects of Death Mountain's weather and storing them to Link's weapons and are able to take those effects wherever you go. As with skew storage, this effect will actually persist through saves, loads, warps, and even going to the menu and enabling master mode. If you want to return the game to normal, you will have to close it. With DMA active, any flammable weapon, shield, or arrow will spontaneously ignite when you take it out. As you can see, I can take out this arrow, and it will actually light the tip on fire automatically, and I can use it to run around and set the grass on fire and stuff like that. And if you decide to switch to bomb arrows, what happens next is your fault. That move might have looked aggressively pointless, but it'll actually be the undoing of Sha Warvo. With Death Mountain Anywhere active, we make our way back into the shrine. And we're going to make our way over to the first fan and put down a remote bomb. Now, if you've been following along with me, then I hope that you collected enough bomb arrows by now, because the time has come to use them. Our first target is that small moving platform I talked about earlier. When we're ready to get started, we'll position Link here relative to the bomb and switch to shock arrows. We'll set off the bomb and then immediately open the arrow menu. And at this point, you probably know what's about to happen. It's time to really hurt both Link and your ears. We appear to be slowly moving upwards. With enough bomb arrows, we'll be able to go as high as we could ever want. The other nice thing is that since Link is in constant hit stun, you only take damage for the first explosion. That being said, this is a far from ideal way to move upwards. Not only is this technique extremely expensive, but our horizontal movement after each blast is basically random. Maybe there is some deterministic way to control it, but if there is, then I couldn't figure it out. We have exactly one way I found to attempt to control our horizontal movement. And that is by sitting and waiting for a good explosion that looks like it's gonna knock us in a useful direction, and then switching off of the bomb arrows for a little bit. As I get closer to our target platform, you're going to see me open the arrow menu immediately after every explosion. I am doing this to hope that the explosion will knock Link in the right direction, during which case I can switch to shock arrow so that we can stick the landing. The platform is really small, but it's quite important to land on it so that we can climb up the ladder and save ourselves about 30 to 40 bomb arrows. We also want to make sure to kill this guardian, because if you don't, then he will shoot you off the ladder and you have a good chance of falling and ruining everything we've just done. After making my way on the ladder, I went ahead and used the arrow menu to check the number of bomb arrows that I still have. If you're following along, you'll probably want to have at least 130 or so to finish the run. We're going to do the same thing one more time to get to the monk. Use the square bomb to give Link a horizontal push in the right direction, and then equip the bomb arrows and just ride them up to the top of the shrine. When we start getting close to somewhere that we want to go, you're going to want to start opening the arrow menu after every explosion and waiting for that perfect blast that knocks us in a useful direction. When we finally get a trustworthy looking explosion, we'll go ahead and switch to the shock arrows and hope for the best. And with that, we have done it. With the unparalleled power and budget of the Hylian Space Program, we have made our way to the top of the most vertical shrine on the map. 
We are left with about 60 or so bomb arrows and we will need these actually to finish the run, so hold on to them. After completing Divine Beast Von Meadow, we gain access to the shrine quest known as the Recital at Warbler's Nest. If you talk to all of the five creepy bird children that can be found around Rito Village, then they will perform this song at the shrine platform. If you use a Korok leaf and these five stones around it to play the same song, then you will gain access to the Vu Lota Shrine. Venturing inside, we are met with a nondescript hallway and a very long ladder. At the top of the ladder, we have another long hallway, at the end of which we have a single crystal switch. If we hit the switch, it'll dump Link into a room full of lava and wind currents. We can see that the monk is in the center of the room behind this locked door that has a platform in front of it for us to land on. Unfortunately, the only way that I found to get to solid ground after you hit that switch and it dumps you into the room is to use the glider. Normally, something like this we could beat with a BLSS, but the problem is since we don't have any ground at the correct height that we can land on, we're unable to start one that allows us to traverse around the room. Anyway, the normal way to beat this shrine is to use the glider to navigate around the four corners of the room until you land on this platform upon which we have a chest that contains the small key that we need. From there, it's easy to just use the glider to make your way back to the monk. This is one of the easier shrines to complete normally, but for our X button challenge, it is remarkably difficult. Now, we could try to solve it with Death Mountain anywhere, but we're going to need the rest of the bomb arrows for something else. So instead, I'd like to take this opportunity to show you guys a new glitch that you haven't seen yet in this run. We will be performing the same glitch twice to complete the shrine. The first time I'm going to show it to you, I won't give as much explanation, and then I'll explain how it works and let you just watch how I do it for the second time. We start by making our way into Vu Lota. I just warped in from the outside so I do not have any save files or anything in here. Once you're inside the shrine, all you need to do is to make a hard save. Now, there is a chance that you might get an autosave when you come into here, but those can be overwritten without your control, so it's best to also make a hard save. After that, we have accomplished everything that we need to in here and we're going to leave. For reasons that I'll explain shortly, we make our way over to Toto Sa Shrine. Now taking a look at the shrine, we are presented with another apparatus puzzle. We would normally use these motion control apparatuses to slowly set platforms and stairs and whatnot into place so that we can ascend up the serpentine path throughout the shrine. Now the shrine puzzle itself is pretty easy, I've already gotten the spirit orb off camera. However, we're in this shrine for a different purpose. When we make our way up to the third apparatus that we can interact with, we're going to start doing some weird stuff. We're going to crouch and take out our camera at the same time to start the apparatus storage glitch like we did before. After we take a photo and interact with the apparatus at the same time, we're going to hold an item, quickly cause the item to stop being held, and then enter the inventory again and try to play a memory. For whatever reason, it fails to play, and we'll notice that we're now able to walk Link around and control the apparatus at the same time. Our goal is near the end of the shrine, so we're going to need to actually walk over this thing while it's sensitive to our controller tilt. This looks pretty strange in-game, and it looks even stranger in real life. However, with a steady hand and a bit of perseverance, we're able to make it to the other side. We have finally arrived at our goal, the corner of this platform right here. Our next step is to just jump off the cliff, and you will notice that the void cutscene fails to play. From there, we're just going to load our save in Vu Lota. As our save finishes loading, Link spawns on the elevator and enters the shrine more or less normally. But this time something strange happens. As soon as we gain control of Link, we get this. What in the world did we just do? Well, we just did a wonderful and interesting glitch known as Void Out Storage. Here's how it works. This is a map of Vulota Shrine. 
It might not look like any map that you recognize, but bear with me and I will explain it for you. The background is a random part of Hyrule Field, ignore that it doesn't matter. In the foreground we see a bunch of dots. Each dot represents some geometric element of the shrine. Things like paths, blocks that compose walls, the light fixtures, and the entry elevator and monk box. The blue pin represents the monk, and the blue box around it represents the cage that he's in. The yellow pin in the upper right corner represents the key, and the platform around it is represented by that yellow-orange box. Finally, the green box near the monk is the platform in front of the locked door. This is a map of Toto Sa represented in the same manner. You can kind of see the serpentine shape of the shrine puzzle taking form. Now bear with me here. This is those two maps superimposed on each other. It looks like quite a mess, but we can actually use this for something. You can see that a lot of parts of Toto Sa overlap geometrically with parts of Vu Lota. Now, we're only really interested in the key and the monk, so I'm going to go ahead and turn off the elements for Vu Lota except for the platforms that I annotated earlier. And it is here that you finally figure out what exactly we did. If you look in the top right corner of this image, you can see that the lower right corner of the ending part of Toto Sa nicely overlaps with the platform that we have the key on top of in Vu Lota. Now, you may have noticed this before, but when you're running around the world, the game keeps track of the last location that Link was standing on solid ground. That way, if you void out, die, or load a save while in the air, the game knows where to put you when you respawn. Back when we were running around in Toto Sa, we got to the point where our last location on solid ground was the lower right corner in the upper right part of this map. We then jumped off of that corner and into the void. However, the void out cutscene didn't properly play because we were doing apparatus storage at the time. When we load Vu Lota, the game remembers that we're supposed to void out, and it causes the cutscene to happen before it has a chance to update our last grounded position. And so the game innocently puts us at where it thinks our last grounded position was, but in this case we brought it over from a different shrine and it allows us to place Link up in the air above the key platform. With our hard-earned prize in hand, we go ahead and hard save the game. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you perform a void out storage. With all of that said, we still need to take our hard-earned key over to the locked door so that we can make our way to the monk. I had an autosave in Toto Sa, so we're going to just load that real quick and set up the same glitch. I've already explained everything that needs explaining, so I will just leave you with the footage of me doing the void out storage for the second time. I will see you guys at the end of the shrine. With that, we have one more shrine remaining, but this shrine is by far and away the hardest one in the entire run. Let's go take a look at the final shrine that stands between us and completing all shrines without the X button.
In this windy bay north of Mount Laneru, we can find Cass playing his accordion on one of the rocks. If we talk to him, he will tell us that there's a shrine hidden nearby that can be accessed by blowing up all of these boulders to channel wind currents, and then riding those wind currents over onto the shrine pedestal with your glider. Doing this will reveal Shai Yota's shrine. Now, the first part with the rocks is all well and fine, but how are we supposed to get the glider out to land on the pedestal? We're not in the Va Meadow fight, and we don't have any waterfalls nearby, so we don't have any ways that I know of to force the glider out. And, try as I might, I couldn't really find another way to activate the shrine pedestal. And so we are left with exactly one X-Press standing between us and finishing the last shrine. But, it is going to be an extremely difficult X-Button press to contend with. So, what are we going to do to conquer this one? Well, in times like this, when you have a shrine that you really, really want to get into, and for whatever reason you can't use the normal strategy, we do have something of a nuclear option available to us. However, even with the X button, it is quite difficult to perform. Once again, if you're a fan of all shrine speedruns, you may have seen this before. I am referring to a glitch known as the Infinite Shrine Coordinate Warp. This is Shrine A. It exists somewhere in the world of Breath of the Wild, and we've already unlocked and completed it. Good job us. This is Shrine B. Shrine B is still locked or under the ground or otherwise unavailable to us, but for whatever reason we really, really want to get into Shrine B. Maybe we're speedrunning and we want to save time, or maybe we're doing a challenge run like this and we can't complete the quest normally. Either way, all the normal strategies to get into Shrine B have failed us. Currently, our Shrine B is Shai Yota, which is under the ground and we can't access it without the glider. The Infinite Shrine Coordinate Warp is essentially a glitch that allows us to activate the elevator cutscene in Shrine A since we've already unlocked it, steal it from Shrine A, and bring it over to nearby where Shrine B would show up. From there, we have a way to reactivate it to make our way into Shrine B. Now, that sounds pretty simple and basic in theory, but in practice, of course, we have a ton of rules and conditions which govern when and how we can use the ISCW. For starters, the glitch that I just described certainly sounds like you could call it a shrine coordinate warp, but why is it also infinite? And the answer to that has to do with the load radii of our respective shrine A and shrine B choices. Every shrine in the world of Breath of the Wild has what we call a load radius surrounding it. This is a boundary invisible to the player that dictates whether or not the shrine will load its entrance elevator. As can be seen from this image, not all shrines are created equal. Typical above ground shrines that you find around the map only have a load radius of about 64 meters, while underground shrines that you have to raise out of the ground have a more generous load radius of about 520 meters. Regardless of their size, if we try to steal the cutscene from Shrine A, but then exit its load radius, the game will forget that we were trying to enter a shrine and the trick will fail. In addition to that, every shrine in the game also has an entry radius of exactly 100 meters for every shrine. If we wish to enter a shrine, we need to be occupying this entrance radius when we try to trigger the cutscene. So, in essence, to perform a shrine coordinate warp, you need to steal the cutscene from shrine A, and then without leaving its load radius, make your way over into the entry radius of shrine B and find a way to trigger the cutscene. I'll explain pretty soon how to steal and trigger the cutscene, but for now that's all you need to know. For instance, if we want to make our way into Vulota without completing Va Meadow, then we can actually use a Shrine Coordinate Warp from the Shrine Burita Nog, which is pretty close by. As you can see, Burita Nog's load radius overlaps with the entrance radius of Vulota, so this is a very viable Shrine Coordinate Warp situation. So let's go ahead and take a look at Shai Yoda and see if we can find something to work with. This is a map of Shai Yoda as well as all of the other shrines in the surrounding area. As you can see, the entrance radius for Shai Yoda is in orange and the load radii for the other shrines are in blue. Unfortunately for us, in the main game there exist no shrines that have a load radius overlap with Shai Yoda. So how do we resolve this issue with our load radii? Well, this is where the word infinite comes in. 
To my knowledge, there exist seven special shrines around Breath of the Wild's map that have an infinite unload radius. And because of that, you could use them as a perfect shrine A that allows you to enter any shrine B around the map that you could ever want. These seven shrines are Katakar in the Gerudo Highlands, Kerama in Death Mountain, Mog Halan and Dog Choka in the Korok Forest, Tutsuanima in the Spring of Power, Shei Katha in the Spring of Courage, and finally Jitan Sami in the Spring of Wisdom. Of all of these, by far the closest one to Shai Yoda is Jitan Sami, so that is the one that we will use for our ISCW. Now, I've glossed over this until now, but the first part of any shrine coordinate warp is devising a way to steal the cutscene out of Shrine A. In a normal scenario where we can use the X button, we have two general ways to do this. The game will only allow us to activate an entrance elevator if A we're close enough to that elevator and B Link is in a state that the game considers grounded. After we have pressed A to activate the elevator cutscene, the game checks if A Link is grounded, B Link is within the 100 meter entrance radius, and C the camera is pointed towards the shrine to determine if it should activate the cutscene and pull us in. If we can prevent one of these conditions from happening, then we can get away with the cutscene stored. For instance, in this clip I stole the cutscene ahead of time, but I turn around and slowly pan my camera back towards the shrine. When I look at it, it checks all of the conditions and we enter the shrine cutscene. And so, all of the methods that I've seen to steal the cutscene from Shrine A involve putting Link into a grounded state, but also above the elevator and not quite touching it. From there, you can use the time that we have in the air to escape the shrine before the cutscene pulls us in. The easy way to do this involves setting up four campfires ahead of time in the entrance of the shrine to produce an updraft. From there, we carefully position Link on the elevator, jump towards the wall, and perform a fall damage cancel. When we do this, we get a split second where the game thinks that Link is grounded, but we're also actually not touching the ground. It is during this time that we press A to get the elevator cutscene and then quickly mash X to open the glider and glide our way out of the shrine. And from there, as long as we don't turn around and look back at the shrine, we have escaped with the cutscene. The other way to do this, and probably the way that you're most familiar with if you watch speedruns, is to ditch the campfires and instead, after the fall damage cancel, do a forward shield surf and mash the X button to bounce and glide your way out of the shrine. This is a lot faster to do, but it's also quite a bit more difficult. Unfortunately for us, no matter how you slice it, you gotta use the X button quite a bit to use either one of these methods. And so, how can we steal the cutscene without using the X button? Well, we're going to need the rest of our bomb arrows, as well as three metal chests. Set up Death Mountain anywhere ahead of time, go to our shrine of choice, and set up three metal chests in the back like this. You're going to want one of them to be closed and facing back by this bump on the elevator, the second one to be open and facing to the left of the shrine, and then the third one to also be open and facing towards the right of the shrine on top of the second one. With the right setup, you can run Link up the back of the elevator, across the closed chest, and onto the lid of the lower opens chest. The goal is to carefully position Link so that he's running on the lower chest like a treadmill while you have the examine prompt flashing periodically. At that point, pull out your bow and get ready. When the A examine prompt is just starting to show up on the screen is when you want to switch to bomb arrows and then press the A button as the menu closes to steal the cutscene. If you did it right, you should hear this sound right before Link gets blown up. And after that, you have to just switch between shock and bomb arrows to slowly make your way horizontally out of the shrine and steal the cutscene. And that's how you steal the shrine elevator cutscene without pressing X. Now, that's all well and fine, but how do we use this cutscene to enter shrine B? Well, strange as it may seem, the answer to that is to activate what is known as a quick text box. A quick text box is just what it sounds like, it's a line of dialogue that remains on screen for a very short time. For whatever reason, if you've managed to steal a cutscene from one of the seven ISCW viable shrines around the map and bring it to the entrance radius of your shrine B, you can activate that cutscene to enter shrine B by using a quick text box. 
Although there are a few ways to do this, probably the best one is to pick up a new item at the same time that it transforms into something else. When the transformation happens, the game will close the text box early. This is why for this entire run I've been depriving myself of elemental chew jelly. They are the only type of item in the game that has more than one form that we can convert to back and forth. We can take a blue chew jelly out, which of course we have a lot of, transform it once into an unknown type of elemental chew jelly, and then simultaneously pick it up and transform it again to get our quick text box. This will act as the final trigger to activate the cutscene to make our way into Shy Yoda at the end of the glitch. And so I've finally given you guys all the background info that you'll need to know to understand how I got my way into Shy Yoda. Let's make our way over to Jitan Sami and start the setup. Now, Jitan Sami is great for the coordinate warp, but it's a little bit annoying for the setup. Of course, the shrine is in the Spring of Wisdom, so there's water everywhere, and unfortunately, if you step in the water, it cancels Death Mountain anywhere. You can see here I can use my arrow to check if I still have it activated. The next annoyance is the fact that we need to get our hands on no less than three metal chests. Now, perhaps you can find a couple lying around Jitan Sami, but the fact is this trick is quite error prone and easy to fail, and you're going to be redoing it a lot. And so, just hands down, the best way to get the chests is to use Amiibo. I'm sorry, this one's a bit pay to win, but you can kind of see the position I'm in here. However, we run into another problem because we have to use Amiibo. You see, the ceiling in here in this cave where we find the shrine is a little bit too low for the rune to activate, so we need to actually carefully climb our way around the water on the floor in here to stand in the stone archway so that we can activate the rune and put the chests down outside. And out here we run into yet another problem. See, we need three chests, and the problem is each time you summon one with an amiibo, you also get a bunch of items like meat and fruits and stuff. Now, to keep the game running smoothly, it will start to delete items lying around after there are too many on the screen, and the problem is by the time you summon the third chest, all the items coming in actually cause the first chest to disappear. Normally this would be a trivial thing to solve, we could just go over and pick up all the items, but remember, we can't touch the water. And so, as far as I can tell, the only option that we have is to use Magnesis to grab the first chest and use it to sweep up all of the fruits so that you can collect them and remove them from the game's world. From there, you can safely summon in chests 2 and 3. Yeah, that's right, you have to use Magnesis as a broom as a completely necessary part of this shrine. I wish I was making that up. And of course, if you ever fail the glitch by accidentally entering Jitan Sami or losing Death Mountain anywhere, you'll need to start this whole setup all over again. That's why I'm using Amiibo. It would be completely masochistic to do it otherwise. Anyway, once we've gotten all of the chests safely into the shrine, with one of them closed and two of them open, we can climb around this wall back over to the side to make our way over to the chests. From there, we can get out Magnesis and start making the setup that I detailed beforehand when I was explaining how to steal the cutscene. After that, we begin treadmilling Link with our bow out on the bottom chest until we get the A to examine prompt to be flashing on the screen. Right at that moment that it begins to show up on the screen, we enter the arrow menu, switch to bomb arrows, and press A right after closing the menu. After that, we begin pinballing all over the place inside of the shrine. And from here begins our process of carefully waiting for a good explosion, switching to shock arrows at the right time to slowly move Link out of the shrine, and then switching back to bomb arrows so that we're not on the ground long enough for him to recover and try to enter Jitan Sami. Be patient with this, and you will need lots of bomb arrows. After all, we're trying to get Link through that tiny stone doorway at the other end of the cave, so you're performing a rather precise maneuver with the world's most imprecise trick. And of course, you have to also avoid touching the water, because if you do, it will put out your bomb arrows and then Link will enter Jitan Sami. Nonetheless, about 50 bomb arrows and a ton of arrow switching later, we finally land in that small stone doorway and carefully point the camera upward so that we don't activate the Jitan Sami cutscene. And congratulations, the hard part is done with. Now don't mess it up. Our next step is to carefully go down the mountain without looking back towards Jitan Sami and make our way over to the load radius of Shai Yota. After that, we throw our blue chew jelly on the floor and convert it once. 
And after that, we convert it a second time while simultaneously picking it up to activate our quick text box and get the cutscene started. And with that, surely we would be done, right? Well, not quite. You see, there is one more thing that can cause this to fail that I haven't touched on yet. You see, we are not allowed to press X to skip the cutscene. And even though we're trying to clip into Shrine B, the cutscene trigger still remembers that it's from Shrine A. In this case, you can see the camera kind of zoomed way out up the mountain towards Jitan Sami. And if you actually listen closely, you can hear Link trying to walk over that way as well. See, Link is actually doing his slow little walk that he normally does to get onto the elevator, but he's trying to climb the entirety of Mount Laneru, and he's going to head that way regardless of what stands in the way. But the thing is, he will never make it up there. After a minute or so of this, the cutscene just kind of gives up, and because we're so far away from Jitan Sami, instead of actually taking us into the shrine, it just sort of dumps us out wherever Link was. And what's worse, since we used our cutscene trigger to get this far, we have lost everything and we're going to need to completely restart the sequence. So everything from getting Death Mountain anywhere, to using the amiibos, sweeping up the fruit, setting up the chests, blowing up Link 50 times, all of it, you gotta start over. And I found this out the hard way. And so, what's the solution to this final problem that we have? We can't press the X button, so what are we supposed to do about this long cutscene trying to take us up the mountain? And the answer to that is something I found quite accidentally while messing around with this glitch. It's a little tactic I like to call cutscene obstruction. Check this out. As you saw from that clip just now, if we can position Link in such a place where his path to the Shrine A elevator is completely obstructed by a wall or something, Link will actually just give up moving and the cutscene will stop early and instead of kicking us out, it'll send us into the shrine. And so knowing this, all we need to do is choose a location to activate our quick text box that will put a wall between Link and Jitan Sami, and then he'll try to walk up to Jitan Sami, get stuck, and will finally enter Shai Yoda. Here's what that looks like. At long last, we have finally put all the parts together, and we arrive in Shai Yota Shrine. Thankfully, it is the only shrine we have to do this way. By entering this place, you have already proven your worth. No kidding. Anyway, as I run around celebrating my entry into this most difficult shrine, I wanted to go ahead and take a moment to thank you guys for being patient for that 20 minute long explanation. I wanted to structure this video in such a way that a casual player of Breath of the Wild who's never really messed with this stuff before could understand and at least try to replicate what I'm doing in part, but I also wanted to make it so that someone who's more well versed in all of these techniques doesn't get bored or fatigued at the long winded explanations. Please write a comment and let me know if you think I struck that balance correctly, I really do appreciate it. Anyway, if you paid attention to the loading screen, you'll notice that I'm at 119 shrines now. What's the last one? Well, it's nothing challenging, I just saved the Forgotten Temple as something of a victory lap for the run, so let's go over there and prepare to finish the run.
we finally arrive at the Guardian Nest that is the Forgotten Temple. Now, you can solve this however you like, it isn't really a particular challenge for the X button run, but I wanted to go ahead and use this to do one final BLSS just to flex on all the Guardians in here. After that, we make our way over to the Rona Kachta Shrine, in which we are awarded our 120th and final Spirit Orb. With that, it is time to make our way to Hyrule Castle and finish the game. At this point we have a multitude of ways to ascend the castle so that task is more or less trivial and I will skip it. And so, at long last, armed with the gifts of the three champions who matter to us, we finally make our way into the inner sanctum to face the big ugly himself. Thanks to all of our hard work in freeing all of the four divine beasts, Ganon gets nuked for 50% of his health right at the start of the battle, so that's pretty nice. After that, the fight proceeds like it would against any other boss during this run. We can't flurry rush, so instead we just have to stand our ground, face our foe, and hit the parry button. After a couple cycles of this, we activate phase 2, where Ganon gets this flaming shield around him. But that's no match for our parrying skills and Urbosa's fury. After a couple more cycles of parrying and Urbosa's fury, we finally finish off Calamity Ganon and we're ready to make our way outside and face down Dark Beast. Now, as you would expect, Dark Beast himself is basically a walking cutscene. Right at the start of the battle, we grab the Bow of Light and get on the horse, and then we just sort of wait around for the targets to show up so that we can shoot them. And everything works well and fine until we have to land the final shot of the run. You see, Ganon will always, always close his eye before the arrow hits unless you're in bullet time. And of course, we're unable to vault off the horse to get bullet time to land the final shot. So we're going to need to think a little bit more creatively here, but thankfully the final battlefield gives us plenty to work with. I decided to make use of the small grove of trees near Ganon to climb up them and activate bullet time by dropping off the top. However, it appears that Ganon didn't appreciate this plan very much, because he responded by lasering the trees so hard that they turned into wood and just left a ghost version of themselves behind. These arboreal apparitions have all the features of a tree visually, but you are in fact unable to climb them or interact with them in any way. Admittedly, I have never seen this before and was caught quite off guard by this, and so for the first time in my life, Dark Beast Ganon actually managed to land a hit on me. Thankfully, I must be some kind of prophet because I predicted that this might happen and ate some simmered fruits beforehand, so Ganon reduced us to a quarter heart and we're not going to let that happen again. After a little bit of running around, I found a single tree that hadn't been nuked by Ganon yet, and we're going to climb up it, line up the final shot through the ghosts of its fallen brethren, and connect it straight into Ganon's head. And in doing so, we finally answer once and for all our question from the start of the video. Zero is the number of X button presses that you need to complete every shrine, tower, and divine beast in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Thanks for watching. I would like to take a minute here at the end of the video to thank a few people without whose help, whether knowingly or unknowingly, this video never would have come into fruition. The first on this list is Limcube, both for being my general inspiration and for discovering the infinite shrine coordinate warp. If you haven't seen his video like this, where he runs all the shrines without using any runes, you absolutely should. It's very interesting. I would also like to thank Power Gamer Kai, who ran a challenge like this well before I did on her Twitch. I reached out on the Breath of the Wild speedrunning Discord, and she was the one who helped me out. In addition, she discovered and introduced me to Void Out Storage, which was a really fun glitch to implement into this run. Finally, I would like to thank Orcrus GC for his wonderful tutorials on the Shrine Coordinate Warp. Both the setup for the cutscene storage as well as the final quick text box activation are derived from the tutorial videos on his YouTube channel. If you want to learn more, there's a link in the description. But anyway, as for me, Tears of the Kingdom will be out 5 days after I record this, and I plan on spending most of my summer just playing and enjoying that without the pressure to make another video about it. 
Making YouTube videos to me is more of an artful hobby that I'd like to spend some free time on rather than something that I wish to dedicate my life to. Currently, most of my time is spent on my major, which is electrical engineering, and I'm going to be starting work on a PhD in the fall, so I'm going to be much more busy in the future than I even was while making this video. And so, I wouldn't count on seeing anything from me again, at least for a long while. But of course, with Tears of the Kingdom coming soon, if I find something sufficiently inspiring, then maybe I'll post again. Who knows? Either way, I'll see you guys in Tears of the Kingdom, and once again, thank you so much for watching.